Okay, Procreate 5 has now been released. It's been a couple of years since I did an overall app guide. I did one when version 4 came out, but that's two years ago. When I was considering releasing a video solely about the, the most recent feature changes, I realised that actually I needed to do a new uh, overall guide to incorporate all the little incremental changes that have come along since the last time I did a full guide as well. Now, I've been using Procreate for a, a good few years now. It's a fantastic app. There's loads of really interesting things that you can do on it and loads of really interesting new features. So I'm going to run you through the basics and I'm going to start digging into the new features and, and really get in depth. Personally, I like to be shown something rather than reading something in a handbook. It's much better to actually be shown something and have it explained to me as well. So I figure that you would appreciate that perhaps too. I have just uploaded a specific video going into the animation process because I did update my uh, YouTube video intro. So if you want to see a little bit more in detail tutorial, how I actually did that, then it's worth checking out my most recent upload as well. But to begin with, um, the first thing you would find when you actually install the app is that you'd come to a gallery situation like this. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be full of my artwork. It would be actually it would have a few example artworks that they would provide to you. Now, assuming that you just went straight ahead and opened one of the artworks that was actually there and you just wanted to take a look around the interface first, I'm going to explain the basic things that you would expect to find uh, and then it will start going into some of the other few things as well. So to begin with, when you look around the actual frame of the, the canvas itself, you're going to notice various different symbols and things around the edge of it. Now, these first five areas up at the top right, these are probably the, the bits that you're going to use the absolute most. You're going to use these all the time if you're actually using the app. Now, the first icon you've got here is your actual sort of paint icon. So you can sketch with it, you can ink with it, you can paint with it, and you've got loads, hundreds, in fact, of different types of brushes. So if you tap on it here, you can see all the different options. So you can create your own brushes too. Uh, you can change all the features and details of each and every, every type of brush. Just so much you can do within that section, but I'm gonna whiz around, I'll get more into detail into that later. The next section you've got here is smudge, and it, it is pretty much as you'd expect. It smudges things, it blends things together. A re really useful kind of feature. You could achieve some of those kind of techniques with certain other brushes because there are kind of wet brush effects now. But as a general smudge tool, this is really pretty good. Having said that, you can also change the kind of brush type and the texture and the way that that smudge tool actually interacts with the, the image that you've created too. And that goes also for the erase tool. So this it enables you to rub out anything that you've created on a particular layer, but you can also change the features of that brush too. Here, you've got the layer section. If you're familiar with anything like Photoshop or any other kind of art editing um, app or art program, you're gonna be familiar probably with the idea of using layers to actually create your artwork. So it could be that you just wanted to isolate certain areas, you're not confident about what you're going to do next, you'd rather do it on a different layer and then merge it later on. Either way, I. I can't imagine producing digital work these days without actually making use of the layers. It's incredibly important to my workflow and just a vital part of, of what I actually do as an artist now. Now, obviously, another major section when you're doing anything creative is to the use of colour. The use of colour in digital artwork is just amazing. I'm a traditional artist previously, so I would start with, I would using colour pencil crayons, then I, I sort of graduated to paint and printing and other materials, but never has it been as flexible and as versatile as it now is with digital paint. Just amazing the things that you can do with colours, and there's a whole set of really amazing new features that come along uh, within this colour section as well. But I'll get into those in more detail a bit later. The next thing you're going to want to use is the slider here. Now you've got the brush size, so you can have a much larger brush. It depends which kind of brush you use. If you go on to, for example, the airbrush, you've got some really large brushes here and you can go huge with those or even within the airbrush there too, you go a bit smaller. So you can really fine tune. Even within the, within the same type of brush, you can really get into extreme sort of modifications and fine tune exactly how you're going to use it. So that's the brush size. Now, the next thing you'll find between the two sliders is a button here. Now, if you press... Here, it brings up this eyedropper tool. It's got a little section in the middle there, if I just bring that up again. It's got a little crosshair in the center. 
If you are looking to put it over a certain area, then it's magnified there too. I'll just drag it from the edge instead, actually. If you wanted to put it over an area where you found a particularly interesting colour, so I wanted that type of purple, you let it go over there and it's just then selected it for you within the, the colour picker. Another way of doing that is to hold the button down. So I've hold it there. I want to select that colour there and you can see it's just selected it for me. Do that again, press and hold it. I've now selected the colour there. It's a little bit easier if you press and hold it like that, I guess and you can see a bit more accurately. Although to be honest, I'm in the habit of just pressing and holding on a particular area with my actual finger and then it does the same job. Now this button here can be reprogrammed to do other things. I'll go into a bit more detail about that also a bit later. Now the second slider here, so you have the brush size. On this one, you have the brush opacity. So if you have it on 100% and you're gonna get a really saturated version of that color. And if you turn it down, you're gonna get a much more translucent version. So you've got fully opaque, and then you've got a much more transparent version if you turn it down. When you come to this bottom section here, now I don't know how well you can see that. If I turn the, uh, the colors up a little bit, or the brightness up rather, there are two little sections here. I guess it's not really visible because I've not done anything, but if I change here what I've got on this canvas, and you can see there, now there is an undo button, so I can undo it. And there you go, a redo button. So I'm going to undo that because there was nothing I wanted to add to that particular image. It is a finished image. Now on the top left, so we've looked at those, we've looked at those. On the top left, we have some different icons here. Now the gallery button takes us back to the gallery and then we can start to do things here. We can add more canvases, we can rearrange everything we've got and that's what that icon does. So the next one is the actions. All the practical features you need to insert, share, adjust your canvas and the elements within it and tweaks up the interface and, and touch settings um, and, and really all the things that are going to help with your workflow are contained within that section. So we'll go into more detail about all these things. I'm just going to whiz through them for now. So you've got the adjustments here and you can see just from the titles the kind of things that are going to be included in that. But you can really sort of polish and perfect um, your artwork, really make it professional looking. You can sort of sharpen, blur, liquefy, clone, Loads of really great features. There's a couple of new ones there as well. Here is your selection tools. Now this is a way of just selecting an area that you want to actually modify. Maybe you don't want to modify the whole thing. You just want a particular section. So there's all sorts of ways that you can do that. I'll go into more detail. And then the last one is transform. So again, this kind of selects everything that would happen to be on that layer. And then you can rotate it, you can squash it, you can do all sorts of different things to that. Now, in terms of this interface, there are things that you can do to change it. So within the actions and preferences, you've got the choice here of changing from a dark interface to a light interface. Now, if you're working outside, perhaps these dark edges and some of the toolbars that are in dark gray are not going to be as visible as it would be if you change it to a light interface. Now, another feature is that you might want to change the interface that was here. And now it's just put it on the left side where you can toggle it and go to the right side for that as well. Now, because we're working on the light interface, then it changes everything. So previously it was a dark sort of rectangle here with white, with white brush examples. We've gone the opposite way. So we've got a light interface with dark brush examples. So you can see it really sort of completely inverts all the kind of way that it would present things to you. Now within the, the preferences also, you've got the option of having a brush cursor. Now you'll only see that fully when the brush is a little bit larger. I don't know whether you can see that. If I go into this area, you can notice that the, the actual brush that I'm using has now got a little dark black circle. Maybe if I go to a bigger brush, you'll see that a little bit better. Turn the size of the brush up and you can really see there is a dark edge that shows me exactly the size and placement. So I guess that's quite useful if you want to go right up to the very edge along something and you don't want to make any errors along the way, then that could be a really useful feature for you. Now I've got used to using it without that and I'm absolutely fine not bothering to use that, but for some people that's gonna be a really important feature. Now another thing that might annoy you sometimes is the fact that you've got all this. I mean, to be honest, the, the actual interface in Procreate is quite streamlined, but it might be that the information that's around the edges there is a little bit annoying and you want to have absolutely no distraction there around the frame and you can get rid of all of doing of those things by using four fingers and tapping and it just puts away the two sides of interface there and do the same again it brings them back i'm just going to put the preferences back to a dark interface i'm kind of used to using it this way it's a little bit strange for me to use it the other way 
but I guess you get used to whatever you use the most and it's absolutely fine. Um, another thing that you can do within your preferences, you probably see, is the project canvas. Now, if you use this, it's going to, well, it's going to be required for you to connect to a second display via airplay or cable, and it will project only the canvas up that, up onto the screen, and I guess you will use this a bit like a graphics tablet, uh, and you can look at the projected image in full without the interface irritating you at all. But then it does create a little bit of a separation between where you're working here and how it appears on the screen, so that's not going to be for everyone. Now, I'm just going to cover the basic gestures that you can interact with the display with your hands, with your fingers, uh, and give you a rundown on some of those basic features. So one of the most obvious things that you can do is actually paint, smudge, erase, do all the different things with your, your actual finger. Now I've got mine set so that it doesn't interact in that way, but when it comes straight out of the box, if you like, and you install the app, it will give you the option of actually painting and smudging and erasing with your fingers. Now, that's something I don't use a switch off, and I'll show you how to do that a little later. Now, another really obvious thing and intuitive, anyone that uses a, a smart device, whether it's a tablet or a phone, or almost anything these days, um, you know that how to sort of pinch and zoom and zoom back out. You can also rotate it, obviously, that way too. Now, if you found that you've gone too far away, or too zoomed in and you want the whole thing just to fit the frame naturally, then just quickly pinch it like that. So you're out here, pinch in quickly, and then it fills the frame. Now, if you're zoomed in here, you want to get a quick sense of it like that, but then you want to go back exactly as you were, you do the opposite, and it's taking you back to the same kind of zoom level that you were before. So if you're here, for example, you zoom out, you also zoom back in. So really good for getting a bigger picture and then zooming in, the same zoom level, zoom level that you were actually using before. Now I mentioned the undo and redo functions on the side here. Now it's really good for you to, for example, if you've drawn a line, perhaps I'll just reduce that so you can see it more clearly. If you've done a line, you're not happy with it, two fingers undoes, three fingers redo the line. Now if you've done lots and lots of gestures like this, in fact if you've done sort of up to apparently about 250 gestures and you want to whiz back through a lot of them, you could actually clear a layer if you've constructed it in a way that enables you to do that. But if you wanted to get rid of a few things, you can press the two fingers down, hold it, and it just kind of quickly erases all of them. Or you can stop it mid-flow as well, so and you get the idea. If you want to adjust how quickly it actually responds in that way, you can go to rapid undo delay. So you can have it so that it really is going to take quite a while before it's going to start producing that rapid. So erase. So if I press and hold, it takes a while now before it undoes it quickly. If I can speed that up, and this is going to be way too much, I suggest. It's going to be too sensitive. You might accidentally set this off and undo loads of gestures, especially if they're subtle gestures. You might move on to a different area, not realizing that you've accidentally placed two fingers down and you've suddenly deleted them all. And it happens really quickly there. You can see it. Two fingers and it's deleted them all. Three fingers, it's redone them all. It's perhaps a little bit too sensitive for that. I personally opt for somewhere in the kind of center area. So maybe almost a second is a bit more sensible. It is possible to use three fingers and just scrub them away, but it does everything on that layer. Just be aware of that. So that's quite drastic. I would only really do that perhaps if you're at an earlier stage in your painting or you've only got a certain amount of information on a layer and you just want to scrub it clear. Now, a feature that I use constantly now is three finger swipe down to copy anything. And if you then go to another layer or another area, another canvas, in fact, and you can also three fingers down and paste it there. You can see it's, I've not got anything that I've already copied or cut. And so it's not able to paste it until you've actually done that. Now, if you want to sort of speed that up you, and you want to paste it down straight away, you can just cut and paste or copy and paste and it will do it straight away. So now if I go to my layers, you can see I've got a duplicate there. It's done everything on that layer. It's immediately copied and pasted it immediately. So if I go back now, undid that with the gesture of two fingers, and you can see now it's just got the layer as it was. Now I've already covered this, but it's part of the gestures. So I'm just going to recap this one again. If you have four fingers, you'll get the full interface without the distraction. Four fingers again, brings all the interface back. Now, if you're on your canvas and you've drawn a shape, you can press and hold and it snaps to a more precise version of whatever it is that you wanted to create. 
So I'll just hold that again. So if you went to a triangle, you've not got a very good version of it, press and, and hold it this time, and you can see it's actually straight in the lines, give you a more precise triangle. And it's the same for any kind of geometric shape. So you create a rectangle, press and hold, or don't let go. I mean, you can see it's given you a more precise shape. And that's the same if you do a line too, hold it, and it snaps to a straight line. Now I showed you these sliders before. If you wanted to perhaps get a little bit more precision with your adjustments, you can see here, if you actually move it with your finger, it really is difficult to perhaps get precise. If you wanted to get to 10% or 9%, it gets a little bit fiddlier. So the best way to do that is, is drag out from the slider and then move your finger up and down. I have to do that a bit more quickly actually. So you can see you have a little bit more precision an ability to actually change it just 1% at a time. And that goes the same with the opacity too. So you drag it out from there, up and down, you'll notice that it's changing those individual percentage points a little bit more easily. Another thing you can do with gestures is you can actually merge layers, you can pinch layers together. It gets a little bit fiddly when you've got two that are right, are really close to each other, but you can actually pinch them together to merge them. Um, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to two fingers to undo that. You can do that with lots of different layers. You can pinch a whole section of layers and actually merge them down into one. Another thing you need to be aware of is you need to tap to create your primary layer. So whichever layer that is now highlighted is gonna be the layer that you're actually using. Now, another gesture that you'll use to do things with the layers is swiping the layers left and right. You get different features that I'm gonna go in more into in depth, but you are using a gesture here to actually do that as well. So another gesture you can use within the layers is to tap two fingers on it. It automatically then puts it within uh, the opacity that you can change. You can turn the opacity way down or you can turn the opacity up. Sometimes you won't be able to see that, but if I zoom back out, you can see the impact that that layer is having. So we'll show you that again. Your two fingers on that layer, it gives you the setting for opacity straight away and you can just sort of turn the opacity up and down with that slider. And you can see it's that tool that's actually selected, so press it again, or an area within here, the opacity, to actually accept the change that you've just made. You'd actually have to press that highlighted icon. Now, if you've created a layer here, and you've created something on that layer, just for argument's sake, I'm just going to create something like that. It's quite bold and dramatic. So if you've created a layer like that, and you want to up, activate the alpha lock, you just two fingers, we go back onto it, two fingers swipe that way, and then you can see this actually activated that. What that basically means though is that if you want to continue adding anything to that layer, and I'll change to a different color just to illustrate this point, it's only going to change anything within the context of what you've already created. So if I just zoom in a little bit more, you can perhaps see that I'll change the color to something more dram dramatic. That's a bright color, bright orangey red. I'll zoom in. Now I'm working within that layer and it's locked. So that everything, all the content of that layer, the things I've already added are now locked, but any areas around it that I've not done something to, it will now ignore. So it will only paint within the, the sections I've already got something on. That makes sense. So that's gonna be really useful if you want to preserve the edges of something, but you want to change some feature of it. So if you want, if you had an, a solid edge that you really liked, but you wanted to create some kind of shading effect, perhaps with a different brush type, then you're going to retain that solid edge, but you could do some sort of shading from that edge. Now, another way of, of change of actually selecting the contents within, within the layer is to press with two fingers and hold, and you can see it's actually selected everything that's on that layer. So I don't know whether you can see this very well, but anything that's now unselected is kind of lined out and then it's only selected the areas in there. So that means you can do things to that and it won't do anything that's in the background. Very similar to the alpha lock in some ways, but there will be other things that you can do with that as well. Now within the settings, you've got gesture controls and there's all sorts of ways that you can change this. So you've got different tools. You can change the way that you actually operate this. Um, it's really quite complex. I mean, you could have it, for example, if you go on this icon here, you go back into the gesture controls, you could have different ways of interacting with it. So you can have press that little square button and touch with your finger and um, it will smudge. You can toggle that on or off. I generally will go into my general and disable touch actions. I 
pretty much as an artist only want the Apple Pencil to be the thing that's adjusting. Obviously the general gestures that you use within a painting are going to affect all the things that I've just shown you. But when it comes to operating the main tools, I don't want my fingers to accidentally do those things. So I go into the gesture controls in general and I disable touch actions. But there's all sorts of things that you can do within here. Now, as I was showing before, you've got the full screen. You can have different ways of doing that. Like I was showing you, the default is, is four finger tap, but you can change the way that that's operated. You can really customize it as you like. Um, but pretty much the, the default version of things is pretty good, apart from the fact, like I say, that I disable um, touch, or rather do it here. I disable touch actions here. But you can create your own shortcuts. Now, assuming you're using Procreate with one of the more recent iPads that is actually compatible with the Apple Pencil, and if you're not doing, I really strongly suggest that you try to upgrade to an iPad that has an Apple Pencil. It doesn't have to be the latest iPad Pro, with the Apple Pencil 2, it could be an older version. I mean, all the newest iPads, every single iPad that's available to buy from this point, including the, the cheapest of the newest ones, is compatible with an, some Apple Pencil. If you have an older iPad and that isn't compatible with Apple Pencil, you can still use Procreate, but the Apple Pencil does come with some, well, it just, it, it, it opens the door to fine tune creating really precise details that you'd, you're going to find it very difficult to do with your fingers. Now, the Apple Pencil does all sorts of gestures. Um, it's res responsive to pressure and tilt, uh, amongst other things. You can actually double tap it to activate an eraser. You can change the different things within the Apple Pencil settings. In terms of the gestures that you can actually activate for the Apple Pencil, you can invoke the eyedropper. You can do all sorts of different things. You can use the eraser. You can invoke copy and paste. There's just so much that you can do. Personally, I found that when I was accidentally double tapping the side of my Apple Pencil, you have to excuse me, I've got ink all over my fingers. Um, when I was double tapping the side of my Apple Pencil, I was accidentally bringing up the eraser. And so I deselected that as, as an option. I just found it far too irritating. Um, it's a great idea. Maybe we'll see in the future Apple uh, releasing an option to just turn it around and use the, the the other end of the Apple Pencil as an eraser instead of using the nib. I find the double tap is an interesting idea, but I, I just accidentally activate it without, you know, realizing at times. A really important thing that I like to do within the preferences is use the, the pressure curve. Now, if you reset it, it's going to come just as a straight line. What I found though, at the earliest parts of the pressure, that's what's represented in the beginning of this graph. That means you're going to have to press on quite a bit to get the Apple Pencil to respond. If you actually adjust it and make it steeper at the beginning, that means you can press a little bit more lightly and it will respond more quickly. Now, I find it's much better in about this position rather than that. It doesn't seem like, you know, you don't imagine perhaps it would make that big a difference. But for me personally, it being more responsive at the beginning of that graph, much better for using. Now, if you've got a smart keyboard for the iPad or the iPad Pro, whichever, um, there are actually keyboard shortcuts to some of the things that you're going to use. I'm not going to go into that. If you're really interested in that and, and the keyboard is really useful for you, then it's easy enough to find the list of, of keyboard shortcuts for the different sort of options. I'm not really going to go into that. That's never the, been the way that I interact with it. And I think for the vast majority of people, they're not going to use this app with a keyboard. So I'm not going to get bogged down in that for now. Now, another aspect of the interface that I was showing you before is the copy and paste. It's really quite self-explanatory, but I'll just go through it just in case. Um, you've got the cut option here. So anything that you've already selected via whatever method you could want to use, you can cut it, it removes it, and then you can put it either on a different canvas or another area of your, your painting and then paste it. With copy, it won't remove it, but it will just copy whatever area you've got selected and then you can paste it somewhere else as well. Copy all will select all the information, all the layers that you have visible. So if you've got something switched off, then it's not going to do select that to copy. But if you've got it toggled on a little tick, then it will copy that and then you can paste it somewhere else. If you want to do it automatically cut and paste, then you can do that and automatically copy and paste together as one action, then you can use that as well. Now within your gesture controls, I'll go back, 
gesture controls, you have something called a quick menu. Um, now you've got different ways that you can activate it. Now, if I go to something just to demonstrate this, I'm just gonna switch it onto this one and then show you how to activate it. So you just tap it here and you've got some basic functions that you can actually, it's kind of shortcuts basically. So you can add a new layer, flip vertically, flip horizontally, copy, clear layer, merge down. Those are ways that you can interact with that, that you can change it, that you can make it more customizable. But in essence, that's it. It's something that personally I don't use, but you know I can see that perhaps it might be useful for some people. Now, you might speak to another artist, another person that uses Procreate, and they may really be into these kind of features and use them on a daily basis. Personally, I don't. They're new features that I think once you've got used to using an app or a program in a certain way, uh, sometimes you just find it difficult to get out of a particular mindset and adjust and incorporate new things. Sometimes they're really valuable, the new additions, and sometimes you're so used to the way that you, you actually use an interface that you know it's re less relevant for you. If you wanted to actually change a feature on here, you can press and hold. It gives you a list of different things that you can add as an action. But like I say, I don't generally use it. Okay, so that pretty much covers the interface and gestures. We're gonna move on to the next section. So the next section is the first area that you're actually going to encounter in Procreate anyway. And within the gallery, you'll find a, a default set sort of provided artworks uh, that Procreate gives you as an example. So you can open them, explore the interface like I've just shown you. But if you want to start creating your own work, then you're gonna to have to start doing some things in this area. So the first thing you're gonna to have to do to start creating your own work is create a canvas. Now you've got a little plus symbol at the top right corner. You press that button, and it gives you some preset canvas sort of templates. So you've got a square and it gives you the pixel proportions here as well. And it already tells you pretty much the kind of the color type as well within that. Generally, I'll pick something like an A4. It's, it's plenty sizable enough for quite a detailed painting. Sometimes I'll go double that and I'll create my own uh, custom. And you press this here. So I'll just go on here. You see at the top here, Within that section, so you've got create a new canvas, you can pick one of the default ones or you can click on this symbol and then you can start to construct your own. If you've got one here, for example, that you've created and you don't want to use that anymore, you can edit it by swiping, edit, you can go and change it or you can delete it. So when you are creating your own, obviously you've got the dimensions, that's the most obvious point. You can change the DPI, um, it tells you the number of layers that are going to be possible within that. So if you wanted to change it to something much bigger, then it's going to reduce the number of layers that you're able to use. So yeah, if you go for something really huge on your canvas size, then it's, it's going to seriously inhibit how many layers you're actually going to be able to use. Now, by default here, you can see it's doing it as pixels, but you can change that to millimeters or centimeters, however you want to actually use that. Now you can see that the numbers are not going to be appropriate for millimeters, centimeters or pixels or inches rather, the, those big numbers are only really appropriate if you're actually thinking in terms of pixels. Another option here is you can actually tap and create a custom size or canvas name if you're doing something for a particular kind of task and you, you're going to give it a name that you're always going to understand exactly what you're getting with those proportions, then you can change the name here. Not something I've done, but you can. Now on the colour profile, you can change to different settings here. Now this is going to be perhaps more important when you come to sort of print things. I generally won't change it, so I'm just going to leave it to whatever it's set to default. But if you know something about colour types and you have specific requirements for printing, then this is going to be useful to you. I would recommend for the majority of people, just don't go near this, just leave it to the default setting. Unless you have a particular reason to change it, then I wouldn't. Now, when it comes to time-lapse settings, so when you're actually creating a piece of work, it will create a time-lapse version of it. Now you can change the settings uh, to, well, it looks like the minimum here is a 1080p resolution, but you can have a much higher resolution. Now, obviously the higher the resolution that you're recording things in, the more space it's gonna take up on your iPad. And you can also change the quality here as well. So you can have it completely lossless. Yeah, and then you're gonna get a hugely big video file that you can look back on, you can take stills from, um, and you're gonna get perfect 
copies of that piece of artwork, especially if you go into lossless, you can pause that time lapse recording at any point, you're going to get an exact version of that paint. I guess that could be useful. And then you've got HEVC, um, which I've read up on it. Apparently it's a new form of video compression uh, for advanced motion graphics creation. I, I'm not terribly sure exactly what that means, but you know, I, I guess if you if you need to know, it's, a, it's very much a need to know kind of basis. Um, otherwise, I personally would just leave it a good quality, leave it to the default settings. It's pretty good for the majority of what you're going to need and just leave it as that. Within the canvas properties, you can select a default background color for all your paintings. It might be that you do an absolute ton of artwork and you always like to start with a white background because you always start with like a drawing stage or you might prefer something more kind of grayed out or a particular color even. Um, you can set the background color to always be a certain thing um, or you can choose to keep the background hidden as well. So back to this general area. If you've got a picture you've already created and you want to actually see it, you can pinch outwards and you'll get a preview of what you've got. It takes a moment or two to click to a high resolution of that. It seems to take a moment just to give you a full preview, but you can see how that works. And you pinch inwards to dismiss it as well. If you want to perhaps move amongst all your different pictures, you can do that. So pinch out to zoom in, tap the image and you notice you've got left and right options. So you can then move between the different images you've actually got within the gallery. Another way of doing this, if you only wanted to select a certain view is to select the ones that you want to preview. And then you can then tap the preview button at the top and it's pretty much the same as it was before, but it's just gonna to toggle within the view that you've selected and it won't go beyond that point. And then you can just press the cross to dismiss that mode. If you're within preview mode and there's one that you want to create, you can just double tap and it will go straight to opening the actual canvas. So I'll show you that again. You're in preview mode because you've swiped out and you're going through your work. You think, oh, actually I need to go into that canvas, double tap with a finger and it opens it straight up in the canvas, the full version of it. So you've really gone straight into working on that painting. So back within the kind of gallery section again, if you actually want to swipe on your canvas to the left, gives you the option of deleting it, of duplicating it and sharing it. Just be aware, if you accidentally press delete, it's gone. Now, if you haven't got it saved and backed up somewhere else, it's tough. There's no way of retrieving it. It is final. So be very careful when you're actually sliding to the right or to the left rather that you don't accidentally press delete because you'll be sorry about it if you do. Uh, you can do exactly the same as what I've just shown you there. So you can bolt select and then you can share duplicate and delete, just as I've shown you there as well. I don't want to delete those. If you press and hold, you can rearrange the paintings, put them in a different order, like so. You can rotate artwork. So if you've been creating it a certain way and you want it to open a different way, then now when you press it, it's gonna open it at that angle, which is not right for that particular painting because it should be like that. So I'm gonna rotate it back. But if you're still at the drawing stage and every time you're opening it, it annoys you because it keeps opening it the wrong way, then a good way of changing that is to do that. But what you'll also notice is that if you leave it that way, it kind of, it rotates it from the last time you were using it as well. So if you put it back this way, go back out to the gallery, you see it switched to that. If you rotate it that way, go back to the gallery, it's opened it like that anyway. Within this, you can rename your artwork by pressing on that area here. So a lot of mine are untitled. I do give names to our paintings eventually, but whilst I'm still working on it, and even when I finish them sometimes, I don't really come up with a title. So I press and hold it. You can change the title name. I'll just put title. And you can see it's changed it. Now, if you've got a group of, of canvases in here that you want to put in the same area, you can press and hold and drag it on top of another, you'll notice that the thing that you're putting it over the top of changes to like a blue color when you snap over it, let go, and you can see it's stacked the two together now. Now, if you wanted to put that one into the same stack, you can press and hold, and it won't do it properly. It will take it back within there, so you can't quickly put that in there. It won't do it. You can actually stack an already 
duplicate, oh sorry, if you've already got a stack, you can quickly drag it over the top. As soon as it goes blue, let go, and it's stacked it on top. It doesn't work. You have, with a, one item on top of a big stack, you have to put the big stack on top of the singular item. And you can see it's just titled it stack now, if you wanted to give it um, a title, so I'll call it drawing. And now, change the title of the stack. Now, if you want to import, Wherever you perhaps you know, have got things, if you've got things in Dropbox or with your Google Drive or in your iPad itself, you can do it that way. Or you can import from your photos too. When it comes to sharing, you can select multiple items. You can share it. It gives you the format that you want to share it in. So let's just say you're sharing it as a JPEG. It gives you different destinations that you can actually send it to as well. Really useful. Or you can just do the one, share it, same options again. Now you can drag and drop these. If, for example, you've got split screen going off and you've got your files open, you can actually drag and drop them into files too. You can also share using AirDrop. You can print to an AirDrop printer, all sorts of different ways that you can share and use that option of sharing. Now, in terms of what you can import, you can import all sorts of different file types and also you can share as different file types. So you can see it supports uh, your Procreate file, which is basically the file that format that you're using in here. It's quite similar to a, Pro, a, a Photoshop file, which is what it represents here when it says PSD. Uh, so you can import Photoshop work into here and it will separate into the layers exactly how you've been using it in Photoshop, which is really useful. You can share and import PDFs. You can share something as a PDF, although I don't think that's really something that you can import it. You can share something as a JPEG and you can import a, P a JPEG. You can share as a PNG and you can import a PNG and you can share a TIFF and a GIF and you can import those as well. Now back within the actual interface and back to the things that you're going to be using the most. Now I've given you an explanation of what these different things are on the interface, but we're going to look a little bit more detail now about the sort of paint smudge and the arrays tools. Now, like I've shown you before, if you tap the brush symbol, you've got all sorts of different styles of brushes within here. So whatever it is that you're aiming for, there's a ton of options and you can actually create your own too. So if you're just wanting to do some basic sketching to begin with, uh, you could select something like a pencil tool. Now it's adding it as white, but often as not, when I'm starting a drawing, I'll go into a white canvas, change my color to something that's more akin to an actual sort of pencil color and I can start drawing straight on here. And the Apple Pencil and the interface here, it really feels very naturalistic, very intuitive. And like I explained earlier, you can do exactly the same with a smudge. You've got all the different brush types and the erase tool, you've got all the different brush types. Now, so within the brushes, you've got the different brush types. You've got sketching, inking, drawing, calligraphy, painting, artistic, and you can go down the list of different brush types. If you actually tap on one of the individual brushes here, you get a preview of what that actually would look like. And you can change all sorts of different settings here too. You can also add a brush type. You can import one. You can completely change some of the different properties to create a brush type. It's just a mind boggling number of things that you can actually adjust within each and every single brush. I suggest strongly that you, you do experiment with these Although, to be honest, if you're looking to do sketching and you go on to the type of pencil that you're thinking you want to use, which is perhaps in my example 6B, you're not going to go too far wrong with that. If there's very specific textures and, and things that you're looking to achieve, you could just import a particular brush set and it's chances are going to do the job fine for you. If you really want to get into the details, then you can do. Um, it's not something I do very often. Occasionally I will, but not very often at all. Within each of the brush types, you can swipe it and do something very similar to what I was showing you in other areas. You can share, you can duplicate it, you can reset it had you changed it. It's grayed out now because I've not changed it. Um, I don't tend to fine tune or adjust the brushes that are already there because by default they're pretty good. So once you've created your own brush, perhaps you can go to about this brush. You can click on here. You can change the name of it and do little features like that as well. So one of the things that you can do, um, if I go back within the whip shading one that I created, what you'll notice the thing that created that is that it changed the spacing. So I increased the spacing and it actually, you can see the preview of it here, it created a kind of dot between 
the brush kind of stamp that is, is at the, the heart of that brush type. When there's no spacing, it just appears as a solid line. When you increase the spacing between that stamp, that's what I was after in this example, and it's just created that effect. And you can test that out with the preview thing. A bit hard to see there because I've got the opacity down on it, but you get the idea. When you've got the streamline, if you have anything such as a wobble, we're going to a different pencil and experiment with these. Um, if you're using streamline, it just seems to glue to the, the brush size a little bit more. It seems it's a little bit more sticky and it makes it less likely for you to end up with a, a rough line like this. So you might, if you're trying to do a line, end up with little wobbles. If you do the streamline, it just appears less wobbly than that. You know, it's very easy to draw more of a straight line. It just seems a little bit more like it's gliding across the canvas that way. Now, if you're using the jitter, you can see it just sort of offsets it. It creates a slightly more spaced out kind of version of that, but it does it in all sorts of random directions instead. You can have a fall off to your brush type, so it can start off as full opacity, and then it sort of trails off like that. Again, could be useful in certain situations. When it comes to taper, you can change the way that it tapers at the beginning and end of a stroke, so you can see it on this diagram here. You can actually change the taper, which is really kind of cool. You can change the, the size of the taper, the opacity, the pressure required, all sorts of different features in here. And the same goes for touch taper as well, if you're using your fingers. Because something previous that you wouldn't have been able to do um, is to actually create tapers in quite the same way with your fingers. Now you have an option of doing that as well. So you've got something called a classic taper, which kind of tapers at the beginning and the end, which is kind of a nice version as well. If you go into the drawing uh, pad here, so this is this area that is your preview. If you found that you've really cluttered it up and you just want to get rid of it all so you can really see what it is you're doing, you can go into the drawing pad settings, clear the drawing pad and you're starting afresh. You can also change different features like the colours, you can change the preview size and you can reset old brush settings as well. So within the shape settings you can change the shape of the tip of your brush by importing an image uh, into shape source and adjust the scatter, rotation, frequency, width and other properties of the shape. Um, there's endless ways that you can affect these and, and really create different kind of things. It's a whole new video just for the brush setting so I'm not going to go too much into depth of that. You'll have to just experiment with that and, and try and explore the type of brush. If, if the default settings are not right for you then you're going to have to just try and find different ways of, of creating that yourself if you can't find somebody else's creation that will do the job. Next, you've got grain. So you can create a new grain from any kind of image, actually. So if you've got a kind of photograph or uh, some kind of image that you've got stored, you can use the grain editor. Now, wet mix is a, another interesting feature. So you can tweak how your brush interacts with color and how the color you lay down interacts with the canvas. So your colors are gonna interact with each other depending on how you sort of use these different areas. So you can use this to dilute the pigment on your brush, start out with a lot of paint on the brush or only a little and make your pigment bleed into the other colors or pull, pull them around really. So little adjustments between this sort of interaction between dilution charge and attack uh, can be layered on top of other settings um, to create really quite realistic sort of behaviors for the paint. So again, dilution, I'm explaining this because it's a relatively new feature. Dilution is how much water is mixed in with the paint on your brush. I know we're not using water in real life, but it's trying to recreate th that effect in reality. So if you add more dilution, it's going to um, give your paint a transparent effect. Now charge sets how much paint is applied onto your brush when you begin to make a stroke. So it's equivalent to sort of saturation in the point and quantity. Um, and, and how kind of loaded it is at the beginning. So like a real paintbrush, the longer you drag your stroke out, the more paint it will leave behind on the canvas. And as the brush runs out of paint, the trailer color it leaves will become less intense. So recharge the brush by ending a stroke and lifting it from the canvas. And when you put it back down again, it will be as though you've dipped it back into the color on your paint palette. And this effect is most obvious in combination with a, a high dilution. Now, in terms of the attack, there's no strange terms here, but this is the sort of explanation that Procreate gives, is to adjust the amount of paint that sticks to the canvas. 
So set it high for the appearance of a thick, bold paint applied evenly along your stroke. Now in terms of pull, you can set how strongly your brush pulls paint around the canvas, including paint that has already been laid down. So I guess that's gonna give it the, the kind of feel of more kind of like an oil paint. Yeah, so this is a great way of organically uh, mixing and dragging colors around. You've got grade, which he describes as a way to set the chunkiness and contrast of your brush texture, and then wetness jitter, which randomly varies how much water mixes in with the paint at any point during the brush stroke for a more kind of realistic effect. Rather than it being too uniform, it just, then it's gonna create a slightly more kind of random effect. Now within the Apple Pencil, you've got all sorts of things that you can change here. So you can make fine tune kind of adjustments to how the Apple Pencil actually interacts with your brush. So you can set the pressure or the tilt to affect the sort of fundamental behaviors of your brush, um, like the size, the opacity, the flow, the bleed, smoothing, uh, and, and more things too. I personally don't get too bogged down in this, but for someone who really wants to get the most out of the Apple Pencil um, and the way that they interact with it, then this could be a really interesting area. So if you want to import brushes and you've downloaded a file, you just click on the plus symbol, click import, and it'll go to wherever you've saved it, and then you can import a, a brush set. Now, if it's a compatible brush set, it will have dot brush after the, the, the title of the brush set, or it will have dot ABR, which is a Photoshop uh, type of brushes. And they're both compatible with Procreate. Um, so any brush types that you find with the dot brush after it, or the end of it, or the dot ABR, you can import all of those types of brushes. Now, if you've got a link to it somewhere else and you're clicking it and it's asking you open with or import into, then you can open it, in for, open it into the app that way as well. Now, if you're wanting to export brushes, you can press and hold it and drag that onto uh, wherever you want to export it. And you can drag and drop into there as well. Now you can actually rearrange any of these brushes. If there's a certain ones that you're gonna use sort of all the time, I do. I use the airbrush and I use the sketching all the time. If they're the ones that you want to use, you can just drag and drop them to go wherever you want. If you have created your own brush set, which obviously I haven't, I've just got the duplicate ones here. But if you have created them and you tap it, it will give the options here. They'll give you the option to delete it, to share it, to duplicate it, which it does with these uh, default ones anyway, or to rename it. Now, because these are the default ones, it doesn't give me those, that option. Um, I can duplicate it. And then with the duplicate one, I can do all those things, as you can see. Okay, so that's as much detail as I'm going to go into about the brushes. There's just, I could spend hours going into that. I'm not going to make this video three hours long. It's already going to be very long as it is. So we'll move on to the next section. And that is going to be about colors. So you've got various different interfaces here. You've got the disc, which is the one that I use predominantly. You've got an option here to change your different colors around the outside of the disc. Once you've settled on a color that you like and it appears within that disc, then you have to then change how much white, how much black, how saturated you want that color to be. And you can see the two halves of that circle gives you an idea of the kind of color that you, you're selecting. And then as soon as you let go of it, it's going to have selected it in the color there. And it's good to use as a brush on your canvas. Within the, the classic selection, you've got the same options, but it just looks a little bit simpler. So you can change your slider for the colors. You can change here on a slider for your saturation and here on a slider for your light and dark. Now, I guess if you've chosen the color that you want, you know it's gonna not gonna vary, not gonna deviate from that color, and you can just use these. And, and perhaps in some ways, it's able you're able to fine tune it a little bit more, but I personally, I just prefer the look out of the disc or the, the look of the disc, so I keep it on that setting. Now you've got something at the bottom called Harmony, now it's possible to create different things within here. So you select one color and it creates perhaps an opposite, harmonious color, complementary color. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail in a section. And then you have things like the value. You can type in things like hexadecimal code um, that you might have found from another source and you can put it straight into here. Or you can take this, give it to somebody else and they'll be able to recreate that exact same color. And you have your color palettes here that you may have created. You can import them, you can export them, all those kind of things. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now, however. So go back to my color disc. Now this is a new section. You've got history here, so it displays the last 10 colors that you've actually used. So if you've not been saving the colors and you've lost track, 
you haven't got it organized in a palette, then this could be a really useful thing to do as, to have as well. And you can clear it too. So when you first open your, whatever, your canvas, your document, um, it's going to be blank to begin with. But as you start to, to use things, you'll start to see that it's selected that color now. So I'll start to use another color. You can see it's starting to stack them up as my history. You can see it's got a color palette pre-selected here. You can change that so that it has a default color palette. You can go back into your palettes, set a different color palette as your default, and then that's what you'll see appearing there. Now, this is the way that I'm used to interacting with, with the, the colors. Um, if, however, you don't want that to disappear and you, you want to be able to use that and have it on screen as a, a kind of constant element, then you can just drag it from the top there and you can sort of piece that around, put it in a corner where you're not going to need it all the time, but it's still going to be there. So I'll just show you that again. So I was just trying to drag it from a different area. It didn't really work. Drag it from the, the top there and you can put it somewhere on your work top uh, and it's going to be there as a easy to access point rather than having to go up to the corner all the time. It is a slightly simplified version. If you want to get rid of it as well, then you just press the little X on it there, gets rid of it. Now, you'll notice the little colour circle at the top. If you press and hold, it goes back to the other colour that you've used most recently. Press and hold it again, it goes back to that colour. So you sort of alternate between the two most recent colours. Quite a cool feature in itself. If you want to flood the canvas, drag and pull it. Try that again. Maybe give it a blank canvas to do that in or in a section where it can do that more effectively. So if I create a brand new layer that hasn't got anything on, Sorry, create a new layer. I can drag that on and you can see it fills and completely floods that area. If you're dragging onto a currently selected layer and you've not lifted your finger, you can change the threshold. So if you just gradually increase the threshold of it, so you can see it's starting to push more and more of that color out into the canvas and you can control that that way. Now, because you've done that once, when you do it a second time, sorry, need to switch this back on again. When you do that a second time, it kind of remembers what you did last and it emulates a similar thing. Now, another really brilliant thing about the eyedrop, in fact, I'm going to go back onto a, a color canvas for this. It's getting a bit difficult to explain this point when I've only got a black and white image. So I'll go onto a, a color image and I'm wanting to select a color that's on my canvas. I did explain this before, but seeing as we're talking about colors more specifically now, you can press and hold on a particular area and it's going to select that color. Now you'll notice when I'm pressing this, it shows you the, the color you're now selecting. And if you move it around, you can see how it's changing it. Now you notice the bottom half of that circle doesn't change because that's the color that you were using or had pre-selected just before you're making this new change. So if you had a color that you already had selected and you wanted to just change it, in a particular direction, you can compare the new color that you're selecting with the old color. So you can just slightly nudge it in the direction that you want. So I showed you the option before where you can select this and move it around, same kind of thing. So that can be changed within the gesture control preferences. But I think by default, Procreate puts it on this so you can move this around. Although I'm used to using it with my finger rather than doing it this way, but it's whatever suits. Uh, another really interesting feature within the color disc is that once you've chosen a particular color that you like, say if you go for this kind of color and you want to really pick the kind of saturation, you can just pinch out that just to get a little bit more refined in terms of detail. You could also double tap and it will snap to the nearest likely kind of thing, purest form that you're looking for. So if you wanted to go for pure black, you sort of double tap near somewhere around where you think the black would be and it's just snapped to the purest black version of it. If you want a white, rather than trying to chase it around the edge and trying to just figure it out, double tap there and you can see it's taken it to pure white. If you want a fully saturated version of the color, double tap, that is the purest, most saturated version. If you want a gray, there you go. Pinch in and it snaps back again. There's nothing particularly that fascinating about the classic selections, pretty much covered that. Uh, but we're gonna move on again to the harmony, look a little bit more detail at this. Now, when you open the harmony section, you'll need to just tap here and it opens up the color disc area. So you've obviously got your kind of maximum saturated version around the edge. And then as you move in, you've got a kind of more washed out, bleached out version of those. 
So wherever you select around the edge, it's going to choose the exact complementary and opposite colour on the colour wheel, which is great. And it's also great that if you go for a more bleached out version of it, more washed out version of it, it also selects that for you too. You can move the slider here to change the kind of brightness, affects everything on that colour wheel. So when you move on to the colour harmony section, you'll notice that it combines the saturation and hue into one colour wheel. So when you're at the outer edge, it's a more saturated version. And if you go into the center, it's a more kind of washed out, bleached out version as well. And you can change the brightness. You can go dark, you can go bright within the slider just underneath it. You also will have these little circles that you can move around. You have a primary one there, which is the bigger one and you'll have either one or a selection of smaller. And now they're calling them reticles within Procreate and the handbook. And you can move them to anywhere. So you move them to the outer edge, you get a more saturated version. You move them more towards the center, like I say, you get a more bleached out version. So within the complementary or within the colors in Harmony, you've got different sections. You click on here where it says colors and you notice you've got five different choices. You've got complementary, split complementary, analogous, triadic and tetradic. So we'll go to the first one on the list, which is complementary. And quite simply, when you're on this, it goes to the color that's completely of the opposite side of the color wheel. So if you go for something like a blue, then you're gonna notice it's this kind of orangey yellow at the other side. You go to purple, you're gonna get the colors that go immediately opposite on the color wheel here. So one of the advantages of using this is it's gonna really create a high contrast between the two colors. They're each gonna be really shown off and appear more vibrant because they're contrasted with the color that's at the opposite side of the color wheel. Now, like I was saying, you can go to the high contrast version or you can go a more subtle bleached out kind of version. You can make it darker or lighter and it's gonna give you the kind of equivalent in terms of all its values, but on the opposite side of that color wheel is really useful. I mean, in, in terms of actually finding the opposite of a really saturated color, that's a relatively more easy thing to do. But when you're looking at a more washed out version, then this is a really useful added function. When you go to the next option, which is split complementary, you'll have, again, the main reticle here, which you move to whatever you want to be your primary color. Now, this is the color that you probably use for the majority of whatever you're actually creating. So this is gonna be the dominant color but then it creates a sort of split opposite. So again, you're gonna get that high kind of pop, that high contrast from your main color, but then you could use these two additional colors for sort of accents and highlights, things to really bring out the vibrancy of that color. Now it just makes it slightly easier on the eye because when you're using the, the pure complementary, it's a really high contrast between the two. This is just softened a little bit and slightly easier on the eye. When you go to the next one, which is analogous, you'll notice that it gives you colors that are either side of your primary color. So if you've gone for a kind of purple, you're gonna get a pink and a blue on the other side. If you go for a red, you're gonna get a pink and an orange. If you go for an orange, you're gonna get somewhere there. You're going to get red and yellow. And that applies again, wherever you actually choose to put it. Um, just on another note, if you've decided that you're happy with this placement, you can click on the reticle uh, place it down in your palette rather, put it here and put it here. And you can see those three colors are now been selected into your chosen color palette. Now this will have a slightly different effect than the split com complementary and the complementary. On here, if you've gone for a warm color, you're generally gonna get the warm colors that are next to it too. If you go for a cool color, you're gonna get generally get the cool colors next to it and so on. When you were looking at the split complementary, you get the kind of opposite here. So you've got a warm color here and a couple of cool colors that are obviously gonna be opposite there too. Now, when you're creating a color palette with these, it's obviously going to be a much calmer color palette, less tension, less drama ge generally across the color scheme, much softer kind of gentler appearance to your color palette. And then next we have triadic and this is split evenly. Although you've got a primary color there that you've chosen for your main color, you do actually have kind of equal saturated, equal kind of strength colors on the two different versions there. So if you go for a red, you've got a really strong green, a really strong blue. If you go for a, any of these strong colors, you're gonna get the, not the opposite, but the, here you can see like the triangle, an equilateral triangle basically across the color palette. So you're gonna get quite a vibrant color scheme this way. 
where the colours are kind of equally weighted. And last of all, we've got the te tetradic, and this is basically a square. Each of those colours is pretty much going to be equal in strength. Um, so you're going to have to be a little bit more careful if you select four colours that are all competing and quite strong. You're just going to have to be mindful of that in your colour scheme. So you're not going to want to create something that's, that's over the top. Now, when you're doing some specific kind of projects, some projects are going to require a very specific kind of colour scheme. And that's why we have the value section within the colours. So just to give you an idea of what some of these sliders do, you've got hue. So literally when you're on the disc, you had the hue around the outer edge. When you had the classic, you had a slider there for the hue. Uh, it's very similar on the value section. So you've got a slider there for the hue. So that changes from red, yellow, green, blue, purple, and then through to pretty much the same red at the beginning again. We have saturation. So you've got a gray up to the fully saturated version. And we've got the brightness slider as well. And it gives you... Uh, percentages for the bottom two and it gives you degrees really on the circle for the hue. So when it comes to dig digital art each colour is represented by a combination of your red, green and blue and you can control the quantities of each of those kind of colours that has an effect and then you can record that elsewhere as well. Now as you're changing all of these you'll notice within this section you've got what's called a hexadecimal code and every time you move one of these sliders, even just a little bit, it completely changes that code uh, and therefore it records the most minute of changes here. So if you have a color palette or colors specifically you want to pass on to somebody else that's using the same program, you can make a note of these codes, you can share them with them, and then the next person will be able to completely recreate that. So all you would need to do if you have a code from elsewhere is type it in here press return and it will have provided it up in the corner. So if I just change one of those letters, for example, to maybe a C, press enter, well, it's barely noticeable what it's done in actual fact. So maybe change that to another color here. And there you go, change more, for more dramatic change there. So again, once you're happy with the chosen color, tap outside of the color rectangle, and then you're working on your canvas. And the last section of your color options is your palettes. Now you can actually import them so you can add your own and create your own. You can import them from elsewhere. If you've got a, a palette file, you can actually upload it and it will save it in your palettes. Now, if you have one that you want to share, you can slide to the left and you can share it. You can delete it. You can tap on the title that you've given it and rename it. You can set it as default. And then when you go to your general use of color, you can see it's placed it here for your, for your convenience. Lots of different things you can do within the, the color palettes. So when you're working within a color palette, if you want to eliminate one of the colors and you're not happy with it, you just need to tap on it. I do that again, not tap on it rather. You need to long press on it and you can delete it and you can set it. You can move it around, put it in a different section. And there you go. You can obviously do that within this section as well. So when you're using the color palettes, if you want to use one of the colors, you just literally tap on it and then it changes it to the active color. And you can see I've gone the color wheel. You can see it will change to whatever color you're tapping on. You can also reorder your palettes if you wish to do so. If you have a certain number that you use all the time, you can put those at the top and then you can switch between those for whatever default you want to use at this particular moment. If you have your split screen open and you've got within your files a color palette you want to switch across, you can just drag and crop, uh, drop it into that section and it will have added your palette too. Likewise, you can share it that way. Like I say, you can also share it that way. As I was showing you before, when you're creating um, a new canvas, you can also change your color profile within this section. Uh, really useful for when you're sending it to a specific kind of printer and you want to make sure the colors are particularly accurate, then you can control it that way. Now with the P3 color option that it gave you there, I'm sorry, I just go back to it. Then you're going to get a, if we go back to it here. So this is ideally suited if you have a display that is capable of showing this kind of wide color gamut. Now, an iPad Pro like this does have the, the P3 uh, color gamut. So it has really saturated, really vibrant colors. There may be other displays that don't have that, in which case, you know, you may want to create it in a different format. So the next section is going to be layers. Now, the layers are here where you've got two squares, one on top of another, which represents the, the way that you might use layers within a piece of work. So this is the first thing you need to be aware of to open and close the layers. Here's the next function where you can add a layer. 
It will give you a little preview of what's on each individual layer. If you slide it to the right, or to the left rather, you can delete it if there's nothing valuable on that layer or you change your mind about it. Obviously, you double tap to undo anything you've done and three fingers to redo affects anything in this area too. You can duplicate layers, you can lock layers, lots of different functions here. Each layer will also have a layer name, which you can change. So if you tap on it, you can rename it just so you could perhaps understand what's on each layer if you've got a clear differentiation between different layers. Now, any changes that you make will only affect what you're doing on that layer unless you've set otherwise. So you need to be aware of which layer you are actually working on. And obviously it's going to be highlighted in blue. Now within each layer, you've got a little symbol here. The default position is going to be an N. If you click on it, it represents normal, but there's all sorts of different ways that you can blend different layers together. And you really just have to experiment through these. You can actually scroll through them now, which is a new feature. And you can quickly preview what the impact is going to be with those different effects. Most of the time, normal is going to be fine, but there are spe specific kind of times when you need a, a kind of different alternate effect. Now, sometimes when I'm creating a piece of work, I, if I want to just sort of create a dramatic difference, sometimes if something isn't quite sitting right, I will just scroll through these to see whether it gives a more desirable effect. And sometimes just by testing it out and experimenting, you come up with something that's just more interesting and works better. You have um, whether your layer is visible, so you can tick it or untick it. And it will, it's not to say you're working on that layer. This, this is something you need to be careful of. Sometimes if you tick the actual layer so it's visible, I've do, I do this myself. I automatically think somehow that I've, I'm working on that layer. So you need to make sure if you want to work on that layer, then you need to make sure it's blue. And obviously there you've got the choice to make it visible or unvisible. Now, if you've made it unvisible and you've got it selected and you try to do something on that layer, it's going to complain at you and say that you've actually got that layer hidden. So you need to go back in, make it visible, and then you can start painting over the top of it or adjusting it in some way. And you've also got a background layer. Now this is useful perhaps when you're starting out with a new canvas. If I just remove some of these layers, you can see underneath it, there's quite a lot going on now on that particular piece, but you can see so it's got a white background or you can remove that white background. By the time I finish the painting, chances are it's got so many layers over the top, you're not going to see that background anyway. But again, it depends on the kind of artwork that you're creating. Now, as I showed you before, briefly, if you tap on it, you've got all sorts of um, options and options menu that, that pops up. You can rename it, you can clear, you can copy, you can select, you can do all these different things that are here. Now some of them are really useful, some of them will go into a little bit more detail a little later on as well, but it just gives you a general sense of the kind of things that you can do with each layer. So another factor on your background layer is that you can change colour as well. But sometimes you might just want to untick it and have a completely transparent layer, um, so the only element you're going to see is what you've added. Now you can move your layers around, press and hold, so I press until it, it kind of grows in size and then you can move it around, you can reorder your layers. That will potentially have an impact on the way that your image actually looks. But yes, you can reorder the, the layers that are actually there. If you want to affect multiple layers, you can just quickly toggle it to the right and then it allows you to do different things. You can group them together, for example. And you can see it's created a new group there because I toggled them together. I'll just run through that again. So you've got your different layers. So if you just toggle layers to the right, you can delete them all and you can also group them. Now you can see here on a group, you can actually sort of minimize, or sorry, minimize the whole group together and you can have a preview within that little thumbnail. You can see all the layers are actually in there and then you can sort of open it out again by pressing here. And you can also make all of those layers invisible all at once and so on. By tapping on the group, you can change things, you can rename it, you can flatten it, you can merge down or can combine down everything that's within that group as well. But when you are grouping things together, whichever the bright blue color shows up on is your primary layer. So when you are toggling and you group them together, you can see here, this is still going to be the primary layer within that group. So anything you do within a group is going to be sometimes very useful. So if you've got these all grouped together and you want to do something with that group, so you can change the properties of all those elements. Say, for example, you wanted to change everything in that group. You can see it's now done that. So everything within that group has now been affected all at once. One thing you can do if you want to transfer 
a layer onto another canvas as you can press and hold and drag it it's got a little green plus symbol at the top of it press the gallery option go into a new canvas go onto the, the layers there and then you can add it as a layer so when you're working within layers if you want to lock it as one of the other functions you can do that make sure that nothing is now going to affect it so if there's something that you know you definitely don't want to accidentally change it's a permanent feature of that and you don't want to do anything that might damage it or lose information on it you can just lock it in place however um often i will just duplicate a layer if i'm not sure 100 percent what i'm doing i will just create a duplicate version of it and uh, maybe untick the saved copy um, and then i will make changes to that and if i'm not happy with that i can just delete that retick the previous version or the original and i've not affected or changed it either so as i was showing you briefly before when you're on a layer if you tap on onto that layer you come up with various options so you can rename it quite straightforward so the next option is select within that if you press on that it's only going to select the things that appear on that layer so that is the non-transparent parts of that layer so within each layer obviously you've got bits that you've affected as you can see here in the thumbnail and then you've got the transparent bits around it so it's only selected the bits where you've got some information so you can do all sorts of transform things, you can paint on it, you can change various aspects of it within that too. You can copy all the aspects that are on that layer and then you could, that's now on your clipboard, so you could paste it somewhere else. You can fill the layer and you'll see it's whatever colour you had selected there is now filled in on that layer. Uh, you can tell the impact it's had because what was there before now is just completely filled in with grey. You can Go on the layer you can clear everything on that, that's on that layer you can see the sun has now disappeared so if you go onto a layer perhaps where there's not a lot of details going on so i've only got some details added up here if i go on alpha lock and i want to change some properties of that you can see it's not going to change the whole canvas it's going to change just the areas where it's got something actually to affect and if you want to turn the alpha lock off press it again and you can see it's disappeared it so you can tell if it's got alpha lock on because it has like a little checkerboard effect on the thumbnail and you can tell whether it's got it selected. So the next option along is mask. So this is a little bit like the alpha lock except that it's going to, instead of paying attention to what's on the layer there, it's going to pay attention to whatever is on the primary layer. So now you can make changes on here and it's, it's not going to adversely affect the actual layer itself so you can experiment you can make changes to that layer without actually changing that layer at all so you can turn that off and you can see it's not actually changed the parent layer and you can delete it like that too i'm going to open a new canvas just to demonstrate a couple of extra points so if you've got some information you've created on a canvas and you want to affect it you can create another layer you can select clipping mask it is now attached to the layer underneath and you can try some different things out. So you can color in, you'll notice it won't add any extra information. Anything that's outside of, in the transparent areas of the layer that it's attached to, it won't affect, but it also hasn't affected the actual layer itself. So it's attached to this layer. It is not really a layer in its own right. It is an, an, a layer that I've decided to use as a clipping mask as a way of doing things to this layer without actually changing the layer itself if you can understand that point. So the difference here is if I was to try and achieve the same thing with an alpha lock, which is another way of achieving this. So I'll go into alpha lock, it has now locked that layer. So I can achieve very similar now. If I go onto a, maybe a brush effect, it's only going to change things that are actually active on that layer. It won't affect the transparency, but it has affected that layer itself so this is perhaps a better way of changing any information on that layer or experimenting with it without actually upsetting the information on that, on that layer. Now, if you're using the uh, drawing guide and you have that pre-selected, that's something I'm going to explain in a little while as well, but if you have that pre-selected, when you open your layers, you will also have a drawing assist option. So all that means basically is that anything you draw now is going to snap to the kind of grid. So it's almost impossible to go diagonally. It follows the actual grid that you've created. So that can be really useful if, you, if you're creating something that is predominantly such straight lines, then that could be a really useful function for you. And again, you can turn that off by unticking it there. 
on a particular layer and you tap on it and you want to invert it, it literally inverts all the colours that are there. Which, if you're doing something simple, quite graphic, is going to be really useful. Obviously, for a full on painting like this, less useful. So with also within the layers, you have the next option, which is reference. Uh, really useful in, in some respects. So I'm just going to give you a, a simplified version just so you can understand this. If I go to something like airbrush and just create something nice and simple. So I'm just creating some shapes, put it on full opacity, create some shapes, turn this into a reference layer. Now, when you create a layer and put it directly underneath that now, the, the reference layer is going to have an impact on the layer that is underneath it. So if you select a colour now and you just drag and drop it into there, select another colour, drag and drop it into there, and so on, you keep doing that effect. What you'll notice is that when you remove that reference layer, all you've got is the impact of having filled in on this separate layer without actually needing the reference layer to be visible, which is really kind of cool. Another way of using this, perhaps, if you go onto the colour like this, a faster way and then you can just go and remove the reference layer and you've got a really nice sort of clean colored inversion without having to have the actual lines there for you so it's not something i've used myself but i could see there would be application for that so another option within your layers if you go onto a layer like this tap on it you have the uh, merge down option so literally that will take the layer and merge it down with the, the next layer underneath so another option similar to that is the combine down and you can see it will combine down with the layer underneath it um, and actually form a new group. Now as I was explaining perhaps a little bit earlier um, you have here the blending options or the blend modes. Now if you have it set to normal then it's literally going to be whatever you've painted on that layer or added to that layer is going to appear exactly as it would normally. I will experiment with these, I will try different effects as I was saying before, just to see what kind of works the best. It also gives you the opportunity to change the opacity too on that layer. So the one of the ways that I would use multiply, for example, uh, if I go onto normal, you can see I've just pasted a layer here. It has a drawn element, but it has a white background. Sometimes I want to just sort of merge the two together. So I want the, the effect of the lines, but I want the image underneath it to show through. Uh, one of the best ways of doing that I've found is to go onto multiply. So you can still see the, the actual drawing, but it's not as a whole um, interfering with the background. It's an additional item that I'm able to add to that under, uh, underneath layer, but it ignores the white and it, it's much better than using the normal kind of version. But you can see there's different ways of doing that. A really interesting kind of inversion of that effect can sometimes be something that looks really cool. Lots of things you can do experimenting with those different layers. But multiply I find most useful in that respect. Um, the ones that really stand out for me are, for example, lighten and screen. So if I was to take an element or an image that has some light features, I might want to share that just as a JPEG, just so I can illustrate the point. I've added it to another canvas. And if I go on to my different layer properties now, the lighten, the screen, it preserves the light areas, but it kind of ignores the dark. So that's normal. If I go to lighten, it allows me to add the light features, like I say. Same with screen, and you can see different effects with the different features as well. So you've got vivid light, linear light, all sorts of different ways of making it look really interesting. Now, when it comes to like, your layers, you can actually share them now, and you have different uh, options when it comes to sharing them. You can share them as a PDF, which will just literally take each one of those layers and share it as a kind of a page. You can share it as a PNG file, um, animated GIFs, um, things like that, GIFs, I should say, or animated MP4. It's not something I've used, but yeah, you can do. Now, this next section is about drawing guides. Now, if you go into the actions area here, you have a toggle for drawing guide. If you click that, um, I think by default, it brings up this kind of square grid. Now, this is the default setting. So, yes, it comes up with this 2D grid. Now, within your drawing guides, you can edit and it brings up this menu screen. So various different things you can do here. You've got a 2D grid. You've got an isometric grid here. You have perspective in which you can set a vanishing point and you can turn the opacity up and the thickness of those lines so you can really see them perhaps a little bit more clearly. And you've got symmetry options, too. You can also change the color 
of your guidelines here at the top. So if you go, you'll see that more clearly. We're going something like this, and I can really change the color of those. So you can choose a color that's gonna be the most dramatic and stand out the best. So if you've got a very dark canvas like this, then maybe the white lines is gonna be useful. If you've got a really uh, white background, maybe the dark lines will be more useful for you. When you're using the symmetry or the perspective, you get this little circle with a little dot in the center there. So you can set your horizon line. You can move your vanishing point to anywhere you want it. Symmetry I've used quite a bit as well. Uh, you can set your line of symmetry anywhere you want it to go. You also have options here. So if you're using something like the 2D grid, you have the basic options of the thickness, the grid size, things like that. And you also have the assisted drawing, which I demonstrated before. So if you have the assisted drawing and you're doing lines, it will snap to sort of lock with the horizontal lines and also the vertical lines. Now, if you're using something like isometric, you've got the basically the same options. You can change the opacity and the thickness of the lines, change the grid size, and you can also have assisted drawing. So any line that you, that you draw on this is gonna lock, run parallel with the lines that are on the grid. When it comes to perspective, again, you can change the thickness of the lines, the opacity, and you can have assisted drawing again. So when you start drawing, it will snap to those lines. When you're looking at the symmetry, the options you have here, you have different types of symmetry. So you see you've got a vertical symmetry here. So anything you draw on this side is gonna reflect onto the other side. You could do horizontal symmetry. So anything you draw on the top will mirror onto the bottom half. You've got a quadrant. So anything you do here will reflect here, here, and here. And you've got radial, which basically means that, you know, anything you do in one section is gonna repeat in all those different areas too. You also have rotational symmetry. If, for example, you start drawing something in this area, and I'll just add that to this so you can demonstrate that point, it's going to continue rotating around. So because I'm going in that direction, it's gonna rotate in that direction for all parts of the symmetry. If I go back into my drawing guide, go into the options, turn that rotational symmetry off, go back in there, and now you can see when I draw that, it mirrors it now. So it's not all going in the same rotational direction. It is that line becomes a line of symmetry and it reflects it. So I'll just go back through these and demonstrate these points as well. Um, so you've got the assisted drawing on there. So you go into your image and you can see it automatically just sort of locks your lines to those grid lines. It runs parallel basically, really. It's impossible to do a diagonal at this point. It just locks. So whatever you do, it's going to lock to those grids and it's the same whichever one of these you actually use if the assisted drawing is on then it will lock to those lines and i'll just demonstrate it without the assisted drawing you go in and now you can draw more freehand so another feature within the perspective drawing guide is that you can add more than one perspective so you've got one vanishing point here uh, which is useful for in many cases but sometimes you want to add a second vanishing point so within the perspective guide all you need to do is click somewhere where you want your second vanishing point to appear, and there you go. You can also add a third vanishing point there. Um, so you've got a choice of one, two, or three vanishing points. If you're not happy with one of them, click on the vanishing point and delete it. Once you're happy with your selection, you can click done, uh, and then they appear in your canvas, and then you can start using them. Okay, another really amazing feature that's been added in more recent times is the uh, quick shape. Now, I demonstrated it briefly before, but the quick line has been a really important feature for quite a while. So if you draw a line, it's got a bit of a wobble to it. Don't lift the pencil or your finger off the canvas, and it should, after a period of time, snap to a straight line. Or if you draw a circle, hold it, it will create a better version of the shape. That goes for any of your main shapes, a triangle, a square, a rectangle, um, it hasn't turned it into a perfect version of that. Um, one way that you can do that is you can see now that I've created it and I haven't done anything else yet, it still gives me the option to edit the shape. So now I can change it into something that is more precisely what I require. So if I wanted it as just the quadrilateral, so it is a four-sided shape, but it's irregular, then I can leave it like that. I can also adjust it and pull and drag it from the corners there too. 
I wanted to change it to a rectangle or the closest rectangle to what I drew, then I can do it that way. I can also pull it at different edges. If I want to turn it into a square, I can do, or a polyline there. I can also edit if I create a kind of ellipse. So I can choose between having an ellipse in which I can modify it, or I can turn it into a more precise circle. And that goes for pretty much all the shapes that you, you want to create as well. Sorry, I meant to create a triangle then. There you go. So I can turn it into a triangle or a polyline. You can see there's some little changes there because it didn't quite match up perfectly. It wants to give me the option to turn it into a four-sided shape, whereas actually I wanted to turn it into a triangle. So there you go. So once you've created your shape, you've obviously got all the adjustments, but you can also move it around. Once you're happy with it, snap out of it, and then it becomes a more permanent feature. Whilst it's still within the edit shape, you can rotate it, you can manipulate it, so do whatever you basically want with it. Really useful. Okay, another really useful function within the app now, you can add text. So I'll just recap that. If you go to the actions, go to add, you can add text. It'll bring it up by default here, so you can write anything on here. So I'm just going to add the title of this piece. And here you go. Because I've deselected that now, it still is a layer that is actually a text layer. And the reason that, or the, the way that you can identify that is that it has a, like a capital A that shows it is an adjustable uh, text box. If you want to turn it into an image and you, you no longer want to edit it anymore, then you can tap on it and you can rasterize it. It now is an image. So I can do all the things that I'd want to do, perhaps with an image at different times. I can change it. Um, if I select it and do different things with it, I can distort it. I can do all those kind of things I would normally do with an image layer. But if I want to continue editing it as a text and change the wording and different features of it, then I don't want to rasterize it and I just want to keep it as the text option. Another reason why I might not want to rasterize it is because if that is a text box, I can continue to increase it and it is a vector, which means that you have incredibly crisp outlines no matter how much you increase it or decrease it. It's never going to, if I can find the edge of it again, there you go. It's never going to become pixelated. It is a vector, which means it's super crisp and it will always remain that way. Like I was just demonstrating, if I click on the box and rasterize it, it's now great because I can edit it as an image, but that does mean that if now I zoom in, and I'll demonstrate this point, it's becoming more pixelated on the edges. It's not a vector by any means. So if you've had a small version of it and now you're blowing it up, you'll start to see that you're losing the edge definition of that, which is, you know, in many cases, that will be less of a problem. I'm losing the text now by <laughs> changing it like that, but there you go. If you want to go back into it, you can tap on, as long as you're on the layer and you tap on the actual text itself, it will come up here. Another way of accessing it here is to tap on it and go edit text. So obviously you can change what it actually says. If you click in it, you can change what it actually says, but also you can edit the style. Now, one of the most basic things that you can do is change color. So you can change it to any particular color that you're gonna think is gonna stand out and then you're done. Other things you can do, you can play around with different fonts change the style of it, change the size of it to a certain extent. Now it changes the size, but because the box is limited in size, it's going to start doing strange things. So if you want to increase the size of the box, then it allows you to increase the size, but it's, it's going to be restricted by the box size. So you can continue to adjust the box and it gives you more options for increasing the size without it sort of rearranging the letters and stacking them. You can also play around with settings like kerning, which obviously separates the layers out, tracking, which seems to be very similar to kerning, really. Leading uh, baseline, so whether it's you know above or below, and obviously the opacity too. So you can change it so it's all capitals. You can underline it. You can just give the outline of that. You can put it towards the left, align it to the right, center align it, or have it evenly spread out, just like you would with kind of Word document options too. So you can import a font if you have it contained in your files somewhere, Really, really useful. And if you want to go back to editing what it actually says, you can go on this and it brings you back up to the keyboard. If you want to get back out of the keyboard, click that and you're back in this canvas again. So remember, if you click on here, you can edit the text. 
Obviously you can move your text around, put it wherever you like, change the size of the box, like I say, really useful. Now the next section within Procreate is the animation section. Now this is a really big update. I've actually created a video specific to this feature. So if you wanted to check through my videos and playlists, you will find a tutorial where I've shown how I've created this new intro for my actual channel, but a really amazing new addition to Procreate. So although that other video does give you a rundown of all the options within uh, the animation, I'll just give you a brief overview here as well, just so you can get an idea. So if you started off with another canvas, and I will do this now just to demonstrate the point, and you wanted to start a new animation, you can go to your canvas settings, you can go to animation assist. Now, if you start drawing something, you can add a frame. You'll notice that it gives you a slightly faded out version, so you can now keep adding new frames. It allows you to see what was drawn before. Now, this is the kind of default setting. It allows you to do this without changing anything else. You can get started straight away. Keep drawing the next frame like this. Now, one thing you'll notice is that I keep adding frames and as I do that, it shows you the kind of history, almost like a ghosted out version of what I've been drawing, but it has a limit and it only shows you the, a few of the strokes that I've done most recently. And then slowly but surely, it starts to lose some of those as you go along. So once you've created a certain number of frames and you, you, know, you want to see exactly what you've got, you want to preview it, you can press play and you can start to see the little animation that you have actually created. So there are different settings here. You can see it as a one shot and it will just play through it once. Let's do it from the beginning again. You can see that or you can have it so it loops, so it keeps replaying it from the beginning again. Or you can have it so it ping pongs backwards and forwards between it. So if I start again, yeah, so it goes to the end and then it will go backwards. So as I was showing you a minute ago, so you can see the kind of ghosted out versions. So you can see some of the frames behind the trail. You can limit that so you can only see the last couple or you can have up to uh, 12 is the maximum. Different skins it's actually called so you can see the previous sort of layers that you've done. You can adjust the frames per second so you can have it as a maximum of 60 and that's just going to appear smoother but it's also going to play it much more quickly. You can change the opacity of the skins, you can have them on full opacity so that they're almost as dark and then even the new ones you're adding are almost or the older ones rather, that are further back in the chain, are almost the same colour, or you can set the opacity to be uh, far less. So you can really see then the most recent things that you've just done. Now you can have it so that you can have a different colour frame, so you can see what goes before and what's coming afterwards, depending on the, the red and the blue, and the green rather, so you can see that. So the red is what's already been, and the green is what's going to happen next. Or you can have the, the primary frame blended so you don't really see it. I mean, you still get the colour codes um, on this one if the primary thing is, but you still you don't get the main thing showing there. Turn off the colour, like so. If you want to add a frame, you just keep adding a frame that way. Um, these are blank frames, obviously, that I'm adding then. But if you've got something that you've done earlier on, now if I go back to the beginning, delete all of those, go to my setting, animation assist, if I've drawn something on here and I want to duplicate that layer, I can press and hold and now we've got two layers that are exactly the same. So now I could add another feature to that, duplicate the frame. I just keep adding to that now rather than having to draw the whole thing again. And I can keep duplicating the frame so it adds all the information from the previous frame, but it just keeps adding new information and then I can play those like that. So once you've created something you're quite happy with, you can go on to the actions, you can go on to share, you can share it as um, a PDF. So each of those layers or frames, because it actually uses the, the frames and presents them as layers here. So again, you can go through them and select them and modify them as a layer, but you can also go through them here and modify them. You can share them as a PDF and it will share them each one of those layers as a separated uh, image within a document, a PDF document. You can share it as a file. You can share it as an animated um, file of some form as well. 
Another aspect of your actual frames that you can use is that when you're on a selected frame, you can actually do some various different things with it. So you've got an option, if you click on it on the frame at the beginning or the end of your animation sequence, you have the option of making the last frame a foreground. Now, I wanted to do that because then anything that goes on is going to sit underneath this particular part. You can see here a little preview, a little thumbnail of what I'm talking about. So I wanted that to appear constantly because otherwise when I play it, you can see it doesn't appear. It would only appear at the end. So I want it to appear permanently throughout. So I set it as a foreground and you can see it remains there constantly. And I could do things that would affect different parts and it would go underneath, but this would always stay on top. Now that's the same at the other end of the spectrum. I wanted something here. And I wanted that to remain as a background. Now, the process I went through here is that I had something that I was revealing and erasing step by step. So I set this underneath image as a background like that. If I didn't do that and it was just one of the um, frames, then you'd see it for a moment and you wouldn't see the rest of it. You can see all the different bits that I've been deleting there. It only actually makes sense when I have that initial frame as a background feature. Now you can see it's raising and revealing that under now, underneath layer. For each individual frame, if you tap on it, you have the option of deleting it, duplicating it, and having it hold for a number of frames. So you can have it to not hold at all, or you can have it and you can see it's just created a load of extra ones there. Uh, you can have it holding for as long or as short as you want. But obviously it's going to, it's basically a duplication. Okay, this next section is about selections and you can use the different selection tools to modify and adjust specific areas within your layer or your painting. So tap on it first of all, it brings up these options. Um, the first option here that we're going to deal with is automatic. Now this is a little bit like the magic wand tool within Procreate, so you can tap on it and you can start to select as much or as little of the layer properties as you want. Now you can see the slider option I was just doing there. So if I tap on it here, um, it does actually remember that the area that you selected previous, but on first starting out, you'll get something like this and you can slide it left or right to select or deselect as much as you'd want like this. You can go back to hardly any selection like this. Um, and then if you wanted to select another area, it's gonna pretty much remember the kind of the threshold basis that you've just selected that. So you can then use that basis to select other areas too. Now this is a, a already pretty much a fully rendered painting with lots of texture and different sort of values, which is why you're gonna get a much more grainy type of selection here. It's not gonna be very precise. Now, if you had something that was a bit, a little bit more cartoony with flatter colors, then it's gonna be really quite intelligent of being able to pick out those different areas for you. And you can do that. Once you click out of it, you've kind of committed to it. You can then go to another tool. And if I wanted to add a specific color now, it would only add it into the area that I've selected, for example. I could also do something like transforming it. So I could take that particular texture that was within that area that I've selected and move it somewhere else. All sorts of different things that you could do with it. Okay, so we'll go to another option. We've got freehand. So literally as it suggests, you can start somewhere. So if I wanted to select just this particular point, there's my starting point. Now I can draw it freehand, but you might end up with a little bit of a wobbly edge. Go to the end and you've selected just that. So I could do exactly the same as what I did before. So I could move it around, change position, change colors, whatever I wanted to do to that selected area. Again, you could paint just within that section, literally loads of things you could do. Now, if you weren't happy with what you've just done and it was too wobbly, well, you can go to that area. If you know you've got a straight line, you can just go to the end of that line and it will do a better version of it, arguably. You can keep tapping it. And every time you keep tapping it, it just creates a, a straight line from the last point that you left off to the next point. And you can actually undo them by increments that way too. You can have a rectangular form of selecting. Again, all the same kind of principles. You can have an ellipse. Again, you can do all the same things. Now remember, this is only affecting the things that are selected on the selected layer. Another thing you can do is if you have, say, freehand or whatever you've selected, it's on automatically 
and add. So you can do this multiple times and then you can go to your brush and you can affect all of those, which could be really useful. Or you can go into remove and you can see now you're selecting everything but that area. So it's the opposite effect. Another way of doing that perhaps is that once you've made your selection, let's just say you've created a shape there and you think, oh no, actually it's the opposite way around. Well, you've got an invert. So currently you've got that area that's selected and it will only change that area. Or if you press and hold, you can bring it back up. You can go to invert and now it's um, everything but that area. So if you've got an area there, you can copy and paste it. And now we've got all the properties that were on that selected area, copy and pasted as another layer. Another really useful thing you can do is to feather. So if you've created a selection, so I'll just create an ellipse and you go on feather and you can change the amount that you want to actually feather on that ellipse. Let's just say you selected that amount, go to your brush and you can see it's actually feathered out the edges. So rather than having a hard line around your selection, it's actually feathered and blended it out. Could be really useful that for you. Another option is to do that and you can clear all your selections. Um, if you've got a selection here, you can save and load here and it's saved it. And if you've got some of the ones that you've, you've already saved, um, you can actually load them into your image as well. One of the things that you can do to really drive home how clearly um, you've selected something or oh, it's not very visible perhaps, especially on camera at this point, uh, but whilst you've got something selected, you can just improve the visibility here. You go into the actions, go into preferences, go down to the bottom, you've got a slider, which is selection mask visibility. So you could really increase that to really make it much clearer, perhaps. You can have it subtly, you can have it really overly dramatic there, perhaps. Okay, the next thing along this here, along the interface, is the uh, transform tool. Really useful, lots of things you can do with that. If you click on it, you can see it's automatically selected everything on that particular layer. Now you can freeform that, so that means that you can drag it from your corner. Perhaps if I go onto a different image, you'll see this more clearly. So another really important feature that you'll find on your workflow along here is your transform tool. Now by default, when you click on that, it's gonna select everything within that layer. So it will select the entire frame. Um, you can actually move your selected area. If you're on the free form, which is the first of the options here, so you can press and hold and drag it from the corners. You can press, pull it from the sides, do all sorts of things with the free form. You can choose to have it more uniform, which means that it's locked, locks this sort of proportions together there. So you can't distort it. You can only increase the size. So you can't drag it in from the sides without affecting all of the proportions of it. You can have it on a distort specifically. So you can really exaggerate that if you can see that selection. There you go. You can distort it that way. And you can also warp, which means that you get more of a kind of curved distortion, really. And you can really warp things. You can actually turn things and invert them, fold them back on themselves like that, which could be really useful for certain kinds of effects. Less so for this. Now, if you're using different ones of these, you have settings here too. So you've got the free form, you've got magnetic, which basically means that it's going to lock, as I was showing you on the uniform one, the proportions together. Now, if you turn the magnetic off, then you're going to find that you can sort of distort it in all the different ways. Within the free form, you can flip horizontal, you can flip vertically, you can rotate it, you can fit to screen if it isn't already, and you can reset things too. Within the bilinear, which is a slightly more advanced option, you can choose these here. It seems to be set to bilinear, but you can change these. If you really want to know, you can read up on these, but it's a little bit more of a complicated thing that you don't really need to know for the general use. So once you've got an area selected, you can obviously move it around, you can tweak it, you can do all sorts of different things with it. You can do this with your fingers, you can do this with your Apple Pencil, however you want to actually use it. Another option you have within Distort is you can do it like this, so it, it, it distorts it in other ways as well. Another thing you might want to do within the warp is add an advanced mesh, and that enables you to pull from different areas and really just control how you're distorting it. Could be really useful. Okay, another section that you have along here is your adjustments. 
Now there's quite a lot within here, um, some really straightforward stuff and then other things that are more complex. So you've got your opacity at the top, really straightforward. You can just whiz up and down the opacity of what's on that layer. You've got a Gaussian blur, so you can blur and you've obviously got a slider at the top so you can change the percentage of it. You can reset it along here, you can cancel it, you can undo, whatever. Um, you've got a motion blur, which sort of gives it more of a sense of things moving and whizzing in, uh, and actually moving, basically. You also have a perspective blur and you can set where you want the blur to actually have come from. And then it almost seems to sort of blur, almost like it's come from that area. Now that could be really useful if you're creating the sense that there's something moving in and out of frame. So if it's a vehicle coming in a specific direction uh, and you want to create a sense of movement, then that could be really good. You can actually change the direction of it too. All sorts of things you can do to really control um, specific sort of adjustments here. So you can see you've got a dial and you can change where the blur is actually appearing. So we'll just cancel that though. You've got a sharpen option, so you can really sharpen some details. It's not really making any effect on here, but there might be situations where you want to just sharpen up some of the information that you've got. Yeah, it doesn't make a great deal of difference here. So maybe if you zoom in, find something where you can see it a little bit more and then we can sharpen it. It's arguable, a little bit of difference it does. Makes it slightly, just ever so slightly grainier in effort to make it sharper. So we'll, we'll cancel that, we'll reset it and cancel. So we can add noise to it and get grainier and grainier. Again on the slider, we can cancel that. Another great option, perhaps more useful than those, I would perhaps suggest, or some of those, is the liquify option. Now this is a lot more complicated compared to those others. Uh, we have a whole different menu of distort options on here. So we'll start with the, the first one. We've got a push option. You can change the size of the brush, the pressure, the distortion, and the momentum. Now, the size of the brush is fairly obvious, and you can start to just push details around quite easily with that. Now, if you change the pressure, it means that you have to press on a bit more to get an effect. You can just do it lightly or you can press on more and it does a more dramatic thing. So you can see there's a bigger contrast here. I mean, you can't tell how hard I'm pressing with it, but it does make a bigger difference. So I'll just go to that again, try and exaggerate that point. So the pressure's way up. I'm pressing lightly now and it's making a little adjustment, press on more and it makes a bigger adjustment. You can change how much it actually distorts things and you can see, well, I hope you can see it's kind of rippling it and going in almost every direction. You can change the momentum. So if I start it like this, it will kind of continue up the piece. I can kind of flick it and it continues. It has literally momentum to it. So it doesn't just stop at there, it will carry on going and you can see it's almost like liquid. It carries on moving. So although I've stopped it here, it carries on all the way up there. So it has a momentum to it, literally, as it says. So I'll just reset all of that. So they're the ones that apply for that. Now you've got another option here. It has all the same features there, but when it's um, the liquify here, you can see it's twisting it around. You press and hold it, it continues to twist it. So I reset it. So you've got twirl right, and this does the opposite direction, twirl left, reset it. You've got a pinch option. So if you want to make something smaller, now it's on a different layer that, but if I want to take that area, make it smaller, pinch it in, you can do that. If you want to expand, you can do exactly the opposite. I've got my momentum on now, so that's why it's continuing even after I've lifted it off. But if I turn the momentum way off, you can see it will stop immediately. And I can pinch in and undo that. If I turn the momentum up, you can see it carries on doing it even when I've lifted my Apple Pencil off. So the momentum can be useful, but it's going to be slightly less precise which might be the effect that you actually want to go for, just depends. We've got crystals, so you can see it's distorting it in a much more kind of spiky, granular way. You've got edges, and which is quite useful if you just want to sort of pinch it in, and you can see it's starting to create a line there almost. So you can reconstruct. So if you've done something, uh, for example, where you've, you've really pinched in large areas like this, and you want to keep the overall effect, but there's some bits that you're not happy with and you want to start reconstructing it as it was. So you can use that to just kind of push back on specific areas, put it back to as it was without affecting all of the adjustments that you've made. Or you can just do the full thing and reset it. Now, if you've created something like this, 
and you want to change how much you're going to adjust it by, you can also use this sliding scale of percentage too. And last of all, like I said, you can reset it. Everything goes back to normal. Some really good options within Liquify. A new option is clone. Now you can move this around to find an area that you want to actually clone. You can change the brush size. You can change the strength. You can even change the brush type. So if I wanted to go for a hard brush, change the brush size, turn the strength up to max. I can then move this around. So anything that's selected here now is going to clone, put into a different area. So I could turn the strength of that down so I can get that, but a much paler version. In fact, you can't even see it there. I'll turn it up more. You can see it a bit better then, like that. Turn the size of the brush up. You've got an area. I mean, it only gives you the kind of center point for where you're selecting. It doesn't really demonstrate the brush size, but it gives you an idea of where the center of your cloning is going to be taken from. And you can see it's, it's taken from that area and cloned it down here. Really useful. Another way to use the, the clone or a, a perhaps a really efficient way of using the clone is just to use it two handed. So you can put it there, clone it there, move it. So rather than using your Apple Pencil all the time, you can actually be sort of multi gestured with this. Also within your adjustments, you've got your color adjustments, you've got your hue saturation and brightness. Um, so obviously I've got this layer selected. So now it's going to start adjusting all of those things. So I can change the general hue. I can change the saturation up or down, and I can change the brightness up and down too. Now, if I don't want to do any of those, I can just reset it. So I'll show you those again like that. Click on the screen, I can reset. But if I wanted to keep those adjustments, then I just click on that and it's kept those adjustments. We also have color balance and we can slide it more in the area of red or more to cyan or more green or magenta. Again, all of those things. You can also change those colors within different aspects of your painting. So you can affect the shadows, the midtones, or the highlights, and it's going to predominantly affect different areas of your picture. So you might have a specific thing that you want to change and you can control it that way. Again, if you want to reset it, click the image and reset or press that and it will commit all of those changes. In terms of your curves, you've got a graph here. You can change all of these. You can change the specific areas, the colors, for example. Again, whenever you've made some changes, you can click there to select it, or you can click the screen and reset everything. There also is a recolor option. So if you click on here and you've got a color selected at the top, you can have a little cursor here that you can move around and it's going to take that color and recolor specific parts of your image with the color selected up there. So if I change that to a red, start to move this around, change that to a red, go onto my recolor. You can see it's flooded to a greater or lesser extent, which you can control here. And I should have a cursor somewhere, which I've lost now, but I can do it by just tapping on a specific area that I'd like to recolor anyway, or I can move that cursor around and it will kind of automatically select that area and very similar areas too or I can keep adding it like that. If I'm not happy with it, cancel it and so on. So the last section that I'm going to explain is the action section. So there's all sorts of things that you can add or change along here in the actions. So along here, you've got the add, you can insert a file, you can insert a photo, you can take a photo, which will actually use your camera. You can add text, which I explained before, really useful. So you can do your cut, your copy and your uh, copy canvas too. So these two you can do with the gestures before I showed you with the three fingers, um, but you can copy the whole canvas and then you can paste the whole canvas uh, somewhere else too. Within the canvas, you have different settings. Uh, a relatively new feature is the crop and resize. So you can reshape your entire canvas. If you don't want some of the details on here anymore and you want to reshape your canvas, then you can do that. You can rotate your canvas. You can change the proportions. If you lock it like that, it's not going to distort it and you can just change the overall size of it or you can distort it and just change one aspect of it too. And obviously you can reset. You can resample the, the uh, canvas too. Now, depending on what you do there, if you set that to be something really quite big and you've locked the two together, it will tell you at the top how many layers. If you click on that, I mean, you can see there's 11 layers available. I don't really want to do that at this particular moment in time, so I'll just leave that as it is. Another thing you can do along here is use your animation assist, which again, I showed you earlier. 
and it turns on this feature. You can use your drawing guide and you can edit your drawing guide. Use all the settings that I showed you earlier. You can flip the canvas horizontally. Sometimes I use this and it's really useful just to get a fresh view on the image that you're creating. If you're trying to create your overall effect, and you're not quite sure if it's working, flipping it horizontally can give you a fresh perspective on that. It can be really, really useful. You can unflip it vertically and you can also gain your canvas information here. Now this is really useful. You can see information about the canvas. You can actually digitally sign it here, which is an interesting feature. For example, um, you've got your dimensions here that tell you your DPI, your physical sort of height and width, your pixel dimensions. You go onto your layers, it tells you how many layers you have available, how many you've used, and the maximum number of layers that are available. It also gives you some more information here. It gives you information about your color profile, your video settings, and your statistics. Useful information, definitely. When you go onto your share option, you can share your image or your file as different formats. So you can share it as a Procreate and it will export it. You can cancel it. You can share it as a Photoshop document, a PDF, a JPEG, a PNG, and a TIFF. And you can share your layers. So it will share them as separated elements rather than just a whole image. You can share it as a PDF document and someone can look through those as separate pages. You can share it as a PNG file. Again, that will be all separate files. You can share it as an animated format too. So if you do that, it gives you a preview. You can change the number of frames. Now, obviously this is not intended as an animation, so that's why it looks very strange, but it does give you a preview anyway. Now on your video settings, so you can watch your time-lapse replay and it will take you back to the beginning and you can whiz through that manually, all the very details all the way to the very end of that. You can choose not to um, have a time-lapse recording because it does take space up on your actual device on your iPad. So you can choose to have it on or off, it's your choice. And then you can also export your time-lapse video. So you can have it either 30 second, really condensed version or the full length, or you can cancel it. Within your preference, we've covered this basically before, but you've got your light and your dark interface, the right or the left hand for these details. You can have a brush, brush cursor, which should show up on here. You can't see it very clearly on this example. If I change it to white, uh, perhaps you can see there is a black line around your cursor now. So you can see where the very edge of your brush is going to be and control it more accurately, perhaps. You can project your canvas onto another screen. So you can use this a bit like a graphics tablet and the image on your screen will not have any of the interface showing. You can connect a third party stylus. I'm not going to do that. Apple Pencil is by far and away the best stylus that you could use with these types of iPad. You can edit your pressure curve, which I explained before. You can change your gesture controls, set them exactly as you want them. And these two I've also selected. Uh, demonstrated in earlier parts of the, the guide as well. So you've got your help options here. You can restore purchases. You can do your advanced settings that go on within the iPad. So also within here, you can learn it to Procreate. It actually sends you to some actual videos from the Procreate team. You can contact customer support. You can create a portfolio online and you can leave a review. So all these are all are potentially really useful sections too. So at the beginning of a canvas, if you're creating a comp, custom canvas, um, you can actually change some of the settings here. For example, the time-lapse setting. Um, you can't do this on the default ones or if you're in the middle of a project, you cannot adjust these anymore. But at the beginning, if you're creating a custom canvas, you can actually change the, the quality of the video recording too. Okay, so that pretty much is the, the full guide that I've got to uh, share with you at this time. Whenever there's new features added, I do generally do update videos. Um, if there's any questions that you've got, please leave comments or questions down in the comments. Look through my other playlists, follow my tutorials, subscribe, and I'll catch you back here again. See you later.